My boyfriend keeps smiling at me, and it's really starting to freak me out. I guess the best way to begin this is with the truth. My boyfriend's entire family was unalived when he was only four years old. His parents, his 12-year-old brother, and his 8-year-old sister were found with their throats slit in their beds. They had been stabbed so many times that one policeman said you could barely see the white on the walls or the color of the wooden floors. The only colors were of thick crimson red. Seasoned cops threw up when they saw the crime scene. It was so brutal that it was in the papers for months. Despite the press attention, though, they never managed to catch the person who did it. Finn was found hiding in a closet, hands over his ears curled up behind his own clothes, almost catatonic with fear. It took over six months of intensive therapy to get him to start talking again. His aunt and uncle raised him, and as they had no children of their own, Finn was brought up as their only child. When he decided to attend med school, they were only too happy to help him, and that was where I met him. I was studying pediatrics and he was studying psychiatry, and honestly, we met as two overworked med students do, at the library. Well, we actually walked straight into each other and sent all our books flying to the floor. His brown hair was a mess, and his blue eyes were bloodshot from working overnight at the library. I'm so sorry, he exclaimed. I shook my head. It's my fault. I should have watched where I was going. He helped me to my feet and asked to buy me a coffee as an apology. I accepted because I thought he was cute. A coffee turned into dinner, and soon, we were living off campus in an apartment together. It took him a long time to tell me about his family's deaths. He said it was because of the morbid fascination people had in him after. Either that or pity, and he wanted neither from me. Honestly, I was in love with Finn by now. He was gentle and clever and funny and seemed deeply well-adjusted for what he had gone through. Of course I felt awful for him, but I didn't pity him, and the idea of him losing his family so brutally made me sick. He told me he never wanted to speak about it. I fully respected that. And you know what? We were happy. Really happy. Sometimes I think we were too happy and that was why it all went away. Then the 20th anniversary of his parents' case happened. The reporters found us so fast. They camped out in front of the apartment building and outside the university. It felt like they were everywhere we went. Finn refused to speak to them, of course. He was upset all the time since they arrived. It hurt to see him this way. He said they had ruined whatever was left of his childhood. I suggested we go visit his aunt and uncle for a while, because they live in such a rural town. We could wait it out there for a while. I wish I had never ever suggested this. But Easter break was coming up anyway so we worked hard, handed our assignments in early and took off at 4 a.m. in a rented car the next morning before the reporters could tell we were gone. Finn's uncle in Aunt's town, a tiny place called Oakley, was in Virginia, and it was an eight-hour drive there. Honestly, the road trip was kind of fun. We talked about movies we liked as children and stopped off at a McDonald's to replenish. Finally, as we were nearing his aunt and uncle's place, I asked him the question. How are you doing with this, Finn? Finn kept his eyes on the road. I'm okay, Cass. I put my hand on his shoulder. No, I mean really. This is a hard time of the year for you anyway. And now with the 20th anniversary, I trailed off looking at how his fingers were clenching the wheel. I'm fine, he said through gritted teeth, then relaxed a bit. I'm sorry. I'm fine. I just need some peace. I didn't ask anything more. Trauma was a strange beast, and I knew that I could never ever understand what Finn was going through. When we pulled into the driveway, I looked up at the house with a small jolt. It was a massive Victorian home, and something about the dark arches and the strange tower at the very top of the house gave me a cold chill. That's when I sensed it, something that made the hair at the back of my neck stand up. I turned to see Finn smiling at me. Except, it wasn't a smile. It stretched so far across his face that it was more of a grimace. His eyes were wide open and made his face look grotesque. Finn, I said loudly, my heart pounding. What are you doing? Within seconds, the smile was gone, and he looked at me confused. As he opened his mouth to answer, though, an older woman in a blue cardigan and her graying hair loose around her shoulders came out of the house to welcome us. Finn's proper smile 
his easy smile that I loved, flashed in her direction. Hi, Aunt May. He jumped out of the car and gave her a warm hug. Aunt May had twinkling blue eyes like Finn and an infectious sort of jolliness. My dear, dear boy. And you must be Cassie. Finn had told me so much about you. She gave me a hug and smiled. It's so good to have you both home. Come along. As we walked into the house behind her, I noticed how close we were to the forest. It started a few hundred yards from the side of the house, and as the breeze sighed softly through the trees, I could have sworn I saw a figure in between the trees. I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth. The house was much cheerier on the inside than it was on the outside, and Fred and May were so nice. We had a lovely meal with them. Finn was down the hall reading in bed, some old comic he had found in his room. As I spat out my toothpaste, I rinsed my mouth and rose to look in the mirror, and nearly screamed. Finn was standing right behind me, that same grotesque smile spread across his face, his eyes so wide they terrified me. Finn. Finn. I turned and smacked his shoulder. What the hell, stop it! Finn kept smiling and I got even angrier and left him in the bathroom, switching the light off. Come to bed, you weirdo. He just stood there in the dark, still smiling creepily into the mirror. I could see him watching me in the reflection. A shudder ran down my spine as I walked into the room we were sleeping in. When he finally came into sleep, I turned to him in bed. Stop trying to freak me out. He frowned at me. What? Stop it with the creepy smiles. What creepy smiles? I groaned in annoyance, then stopped. Maybe this was his way of dealing with what happened to his family. Maybe playing pranks on me was helping him feel better. Having rationalized it and feeling a bit better, I switched off my bedside light and fell asleep. I awoke to the sound of the door creaking open. When I opened my eyes, I caught sight of his white t-shirt as Finn walked out of the room. It was still dark out. I blinked away my sleep and checked the time. 3.30 a.m. Quietly, I listened to his footsteps, thinking he was heading to the bathroom. When I heard him going further, then down the stairs, I got up. Putting on my slippers and my dressing gown, I went to the banister and hissed, Finn! He was at the bottom of the stairs, but he wouldn't look at me. Instead, he kept walking, a strange, slow, shuffling walk. Soon, he was at the front door. I moved as quickly and quietly as I could, but he had already opened the front door and walked outside into the slightly misty night. Finn? I was extremely annoyed now and grabbed my coat from the coat rack and my sneakers. By the time I had got everything on, he had already reached the forest line. He turned and my blood ran cold. There it was, that bone-chilling smile again. What the heck was he playing at? He disappeared into the forest, and I raced after him. Finn, I called out as I got to the forest line. My eyes darted between the trees trying to see where he had gone. No response. That's when I started hearing the humming. It was low and slightly creepy, but it sounded like him and I wasn't going to leave this forest without him. I pulled out my phone and put on the flashlight so that I could see where I was going as the leaves crunched under my feet. In the distance, just beyond the light, I thought I saw him. Finn, come back, I yelled at the figure. And then the figure began to run, and I mean sprint away from me. I chased him through the woods. I was starting to lose my breath quite quickly, and there was already a stitch in my side, but I wouldn't stop running. All those late-night coffees and takeout studying were catching up to me. Finally, the figure stopped. I stopped behind him. We have to go back, I told him breathlessly as I leaned against a tree. It's not safe out here. The figure didn't move. Something felt really off. Slowly, I raised my flashlight in his direction. It was Finn, but he looked wrong. And then I realized what it was. His body was facing forwards, but his head and his feet were facing me. And on his face, there was that hideous, terrible grin. I screamed and fell backwards onto the grass. The thing that was Finn raised his arm and pointed upwards. As I tried to crawl away, a high-pitched cackle escaped his lips. My hands finally found purchase on the cold, wet ground, and I scrambled to my feet. As I did, my flashlight gave me a view of him again, and I screamed, but something gave me a terrifying pause. Slowly, I moved my torch upwards to see what he was pointing at. Two pairs of blood-covered feet were dangling. My hand on my mouth, 
I raised my torch further up to see the hanging, brutally stabbed bodies of Aunt May and Uncle Fred. But it was their faces, their faces that made me scream. On both their faces I saw it, that same blood-curdling grin. I opened my mouth to scream, but to my horror so did the thing that was Finn. He let out an unearthly high-pitched scream that seemed to last forever. I didn't wait for any more. I raced away from the scene to the house. I swear I could hear Finn's footsteps behind me. I ran and ran but found myself tripping face first over a root. I screeched as I fell, my fear telling me I was doomed, that he was going to catch me, that a sharp pain went through my head as I hit the ground. I blacked out. I woke up the next morning in bed, in the house. A headache slammed into me. As I tried to sit up, a familiar voice said, Hey, hey, slow down. A gentle hand pushed me back till my head was back on the pillow. May's face came into view, concern etched all over it. You fell down the stairs in the middle of the night, she said. Wait, but she was dead. You got quite a nasty bump on your head, dear, she continued, perfectly alive. I frowned and touched my head, unable to find the words to speak. Finn found you. She continued as she took my hand away from my head. Don't worry. You're going to be okay. You just need rest. But I... You were in... I couldn't even find the words. What was happening? Had last night been... A nightmare, I rationalized. A nightmare brought on by a fall. Slowly I relaxed. Just a silly, horrid dream because I hit my head. Aunt May stood up. I'm going to get you some tea. She walked out the door, closing it softly behind her. I got up slowly, trying to ease my aching head. That's when I noticed the mud, all over the floor. I swallowed hard as I gently put my feet on the ground. That was the moment when a cold hand grabbed my ankle. Too terrified to scream, I looked down to see Finn's head poke out from under the bed. He slowly turned to look at me, and smiled that same grotesque, hideous smile.